Hi, I'm Brian Miller, professional wood finisher. Today we're here at William Ng's School of Woodworking in Anaheim, California. What I want to do today is show you how to take this very simple recessed panel oak door, how to take it through the stages of prepping it for color and finish. And something else we're going to do today is fill the open grain with something called paste wood filler. We're ready to start doing some sanding, but prior to that, let's take either you could use a vacuum or take some compressed air and make sure the surface is actually clean before we apply our sandpaper to the surface. So we'll take a little bit of compressed air, dust the surface off, make sure it's clean. And the next thing we're going to do, for those of you that have done any amount of sanding at all, what happens towards the end of the day, your fingers start to get a little bit raw and rather sensitive. So what I want to do is take some masking tape, since I don't have a glove with me today, and apply some masking tape to my fingers. At this point, we're going to take some one inch masking tape, about a six inch strip, and we'll start with our index finger, apply it at an angle, not because I'm a baby, but because I want to save my skin, I want to save the sanding for the wood. Wrap it around, fold the tip over, and bring it around like this, maybe something like you would use on a bandage for your finger. So to keep track of where I'm at, I'm going to start right here on this one edge. I want to ease that slightly off with this 220 grit sandpaper. And what I did with this is I took the sandpaper, I folded it in a third and folded in another third. Now I have three surface areas I can use. The paper doesn't slip when you do this as well. So I'm going to ease this one edge off here. That feels great. I have no masking tape on this finger so I can actually see what I'm doing and feel what I'm doing. Now I will take this part of the door. That feels good. I'll go along here, also ease this edge off as well. I'm going to do that all the way around the entire door and what I'll usually do is rotate it like this. I know I've done this piece. Next I'll do this. So when I'm ready I will turn it again. Do this, turn it again, and catch this edge. At this stage, we're ready to move on to our next step. But before we do that, we want to take the sanding dust off the surface. Again, we're going to use some compressed air in a minute. But what I want to also mention, too, is if you have your shop at home that you're also doing your finishing in, it's a good idea to do this at the end of your garage or take the door outside when you're ready to dust it off. You don't want to create a sanding cloud inside of your shop when you're want to start applying finish. So we finished with our compressed air and I did use compressed air over something that is very popular nowadays called a tack cloth. What that is is they take cheesecloth and they soak it in a mixture of varnish and boiled linseed oil. It becomes very gummy and sticky. The problem I have with that, especially on a wood like oak, it's not going to pick up all that sanding dust out of the open grain. Tack cloths are okay if you're using a closed grain wood like maple where it's going to pick all the sanding dust off. Another reason I don't use a tack cloth is if you're using say a waterborne finish, um, it can have adhesion issues if there's a little bit of residue from that tack cloth. So I opt to use compressed air. The coloring method we're going to use today on our recessed panel oak door, we're going to use something called iron acetate. What the heck is iron acetate, Brian? Well, what iron acetate is, is this right here. You say, well, where do I find this? And you can't go to any store and buy this. What you do is you make this. And the way you make this, it's very simple. Trust me. If I can do it, any of you can do it. Take 4 out steel wool. Shred the steel wool like so. We're going to use just one pad since we're going to make just a very small amount. Next, you want to take some apple cider vinegar. You want to use apple cider versus distilled because of the acidity that also comes from the apples helps create this iron acetate. What it does, the acetic acid in it reacts to the iron in the steel wool and after about four to five days it's going to break this down and we're going to have a very potent dye. Very important thing is to not, and I repeat, do not, put this product in a closed container and cover it. It creates an off gas and what will happen is if you put it in something glass it's going to explode. You're going to get that color over everything you don't want it on. So after about four to five days the steel wool will break down with the apple cider vinegar. I will strain the solution through something like a cone strainer like this. 
You could use a coffee filter if you don't have any cone strainers, or if you want to live dangerously, use your wife's nylon stockings. Those will work well. But I would probably opt not to do that. Before we actually apply the solution, though, we want to pre-raise the grain. And the reason being is, with this solution having a percentage of water, it's going to raise the grain anyways. And I'd rather do that with clean water, and in this case distilled, because it doesn't have chlorine in it uh, like tap water has. We're going to raise that grain now with the distilled water. So I'm just going to use a clean cloth and just get the surface wet with the distilled water. Just very quickly, you don't have to flood the surface, it's not that important, just get it wet. The wood fibers are going to stand up with the water and then we're going to take that 220 grit sandpaper that we last used for finish sanding and just de-whisker the surface. It's important not to do any more than just knock down the wood fibers that stand up after the surface has dried. Again, really important to have clean hands when you start doing any part of the finishing, whether it's sanding or applying color or just the water at this point. The surface is completely dry and all we want to do, like I say, is knock down those raised wood fibers. You don't want to over sand it. I'm just very gently hitting it that quickly. Now as I get to the panel, I'm going to hit this little detail here. I'm not using much pressure at all, very gentle, just to, de like I say, de-whisker that surface. That's it, you're done. You don't need to do any more than that. Now we're going to take our compressed air again, just dust off uh, the sanding dust. Next we're ready to actually apply our iron acetate, sometimes called iron buff. Uh, George Frank, very famous wood finisher, used to refer to this as liquid nightmare. So I'll give it a quick shake real, and put it into a small plastic cup. Next I'm going to put on a pair of gloves because I don't want to ruin my nice manicure that I just had done last week. Now I always wear gloves when I'm applying most any solutions. And we're not going to use a clean cloth like we did on the water. What we're going to use is a nylon brush, which I will talk about at a further time on what brush to use with what particular type of finish. But today, a nylon brush for this. Just dip it in, start in the center of the panel, away from our edges, and brush it into the surface. I'm not going to flood the surface because since this is a recessed panel door, some of it's going to want to wick underneath, and if I flood it, what happens is this will dry, it'll wick back out and create a line and create a water line. So you can see this color is changing instantaneously. It goes on light, but yet it's getting darker. Now this is not um, ebonizing. This is a different type of method. This was originally used by Gustav Stickley, or he used to use it quite a bit rather. It was actually brought over from Europe. And what they would do is Gustav Stickley would take rainwater in a barrel, throw scrap pieces of metal, uh, screws, hinges, things like that that were iron. They would put the apple cider vinegar in with a solution of rainwater. And what would happen is they would let this just steep and create this very, very potent dye as you can see right here. So this is changing the color of the wood chemically. It's reacting to tannic acid that is naturally in both red and white oak. White oak is richer in tannic acid than red oak is, but you can see we do have a dramatic color change right away. Now we are ready to actually apply some clear finish. And the reason we want to apply clear finish now before we put on our paste wood filler is, the idea with the paste filler is just to fill the open grain of the oak and not color the rest of it because we've already done that with our iron buff solution, our iron acetate solution. So the finish we're going to use today is going to be something by the Valspar company. This is pre-catalyzed gloss uh, lacquer. And if, for those of you that have never used lacquer before, it has to be spray applied. It's very hard to try to brush it. It dries very, very quickly. This is also what they call 275 uh, VOC HAPS-free lacquer. And what that means is it's got 275 of volatile organic compounds that get emitted into the atmosphere. 
The reason this is a legal lacquer here in Los Angeles now is they use acetone to thin this versus lacquer thinner, what they used to use. Acetone is considered a non-hazardous air pollutant. Now we're ready to actually apply our lacquer. And the type of spray gun we're gonna use for that today, this is a gravity feed gun. Material goes in here, the lacquer. And this is considered an HVLP gun, high volume, low pressure. It puts out about 10 PSI at the tip. This is also called a conversion gun. It's not run off a turbine air system, it's run off compressed air. So it's considered a conversion gun because it converts compressed air to high volume, low pressure. The advantage of that is more of the spray goes onto the surface you're trying to finish versus a cloud of overspray in and around what it is you're trying to finish. So this is the type of gun that is mandatory to be used now in Los Angeles area if you have a finishing shop full time and that's what you're doing. So let's mix our lacquer now. I'm gonna take some, this is a brand new can I opened up so I don't need to strain it. If this was used material and I had used it in the past to spray other things with, I would definitely strain the material but it's absolutely clean. So we'll put this in. Probably only got about eight ounces in here. I'm gonna add a little bit of acetone to this. Maybe about 15 to 20%. And I'm gonna add just a touch of something called lacquer retarder. This will slow down the evaporation rate. This is actually glycol ether. This will slow down the evaporation rate of our lacquer. Really important, especially in hot weather, that you do this. So the next thing we'll do is we'll stir this up and we are ready to spray. We've hooked our airline up to our spray gun now. We have our air compressor set at about 30 PSI. Very important that you remember, if you're spraying in your home garage and you've got a water heater in that garage, turn it off. You don't want that pilot light running while you're spraying this very combustible material. Also as important as that is wearing a respirator, another piece of safety equipment. When I'm not using this dual filter respirator, I put it in a Ziploc bag like this because if you put it on a hook in your garage, air is gonna travel through these filters and wear them out prematurely. I'm gonna shoot the perimeter first. And now I will shoot the face. Done. If you noticed, I had this red paper down. This is called rosin paper. You can buy this at most paint stores or your big home box stores. And the reason I like to use that is I want to have a clean surface all the time. Here I have a Lazy Susan uh, that we've used. You typically have these in a kitchen inside of a cabinet. Um, we have this here so we can spin our doors when we're spraying to where we don't have to sit there and pick it up and move it around ourselves. Also, I put the paper on top of the Lazy Susan. That way I can change it throughout the course of the day. That overspray of lacquer is going to get on the paper and you can get big crumbs of it. And a lot of times the air from the gun itself We'll loosen those up, they'll land up on the surface, and it's always gonna be your final coat. Our spray applied lacquer coat is now dry and it's ready to be lightly sanded. And the reason it needs to be sanded is, the first coat of finish you put on the wood is a sanding sealer. There are separate sanding sealers made especially for products like our pre-catalyzed lacquer that we just applied. Pre-catalyzed means it has a weak acid catalyst added to it. What that does is help when it dries, it dries a little bit faster. It dries a little bit harder, a little more resilient to both scuff marks, abrasion, um, and heat and alcohol. So a good choice for kitchen cabinetry. There are separate sealers made and they're called lacquer sanding sealers. The difference between that product and this product is it has something called zinc stearate added to it, which is a soap-like substance and it makes it sand a little easier between coats. Some people will think that, well, if one coat of that works great, then two to three have to be even better, and that's not the case. When it has that, that zinc stearate added to it, it does make it dry a little bit softer, so you want to use just one coat. The advantage of a pre-catalyzed lacquer is it does not require a specific 
sealer coat. Now it's time to give this a very quick sand. And when I say quick, it requires very little sanding to de-whisker this surface. We have some brand new 400 grit finish sandpaper. What I like to do is, oh, I like to keep my older finishing sandpaper that's really no longer useful for sanding the bare wood, but is perfectly good for sanding between coats. Also, when it gets older, that backing breaks down a little bit, makes it a little more pliable to get into some of these areas. So here we go. I'm gonna take two pieces of brand new paper, just rub them together and knock that grit down a little bit more. This is how quickly you wanna do this. Also, you wanna take your hand and roll it away from this edge. If you lean on it like so, you're gonna burn right through that edge, cut into your color, and you're gonna have bare wood showing. So take it and just sort of bend it away from this edge here. That is it. That's as much as you have to sand that. What I like to do for details like this though, you may say, well, you know what? It's a little hard to bend the sandpaper and I'm afraid I might burn into that edge. These microfiber pads or these synthetic pads are perfect for little details like this. Give that a quick sand. Now it's smoothed out, it's, we're ready to go. Now we have a little bit of sanding dust on the surface that we want to remove. I prefer compressed air. Uh, you may want to use a vacuum at home. Some of you may have found these handy, these tack rags. Personally, I find the best use for this is right over here in the circular file. We've removed our sanding dust. At this point, we're actually ready to start filling the open pores with something called paste wood filler. The one we're going to use today, this is by the Mohawk Company. They're very well respected in the finishing industry. This is an oil base filler. And you may say, well, filler, does that fill nail holes, imperfections in the wood? No, this product is designed to fill the open grain and make it dead smooth. If your goal was to take an open grain wood like oak and make it absolutely smooth like a piece of, say, cherry or maple, that's a closed grain wood so you can get that glass smooth finish. I'm not so worried about this today. What I want to do though is I have some of the filler in this container. We're going to add some of this pale gold, finely ground powder. And it's not actually gold. It's made out of typically brass and maybe some copper. We're going to add it to our filler. Then we're going to add a little paint thinner to it to make it a cream-like consistency. You want a heavy cream. We're going to put it onto the wood and I'm going to do that next. I have some of the filler in our plastic container here. It's very thick as you can see. What I want to do is thin that out with a little bit of paint thinner since this is an oil-based paste wood filler. So the goal is to make it like a heavy cream consistency. So we will just mix this up a little bit. That's good. At this point, now we're going to take some of our finely ground powder, this pale gold powder, and start adding it to our filler. There's a quarter teaspoon. I'm going to go another quarter. I think a third quarter. And maybe just one more. So that would give us roughly a teaspoon. Just dip your brush into the filler. Don't wipe it off like this. I see people do this all the time. Now you've taken all the material off the end of the brush. Turn it like this, give it a little tap, a little tap. Now the brush is loaded with this filler. I'm just gonna brush it onto this part of our door. That's it, leave it alone. Now we're gonna take this plastic squeegee and take it off at say a 45 degree angle. and take that excess off. So there is a little bit of waste that's gonna take place here because all we're trying to do is fill the open grain. Now we're gonna do this edge, just brush it on. Brush is loaded with our paste filler with our gold color in it. It's kinda of hard to go to 45, so we're not gonna worry about that quite so much on this. Now we're going to go around the entire door and do this to every surface.
Our filler is dry now and it's sort of formed a little bit of a haze, something like a car wax would do if you still wax your own car, which most of you probably don't do. But for those old enough, you'll remember that when you used to get out there and laboriously have to apply the wax, let it haze over, and then you took it off with a very soft pad. In this case, we're going to use a piece of burlap. You can buy these at most any nursery will carry this. Just buy the burlap, cut it into a small enough piece. And what you're going to do is just simply take it like so and buff off the excess filler to where it's just into the open grain here. So as you can see right here, we have a fair amount of excess that's in the pores. So what we want to do to get that out of the corners, let's take a putty knife and a nice soft clean cloth, fold it over the putty knife, and that way you can just work this into the corners like so. We still have the perimeter to deal with, so let's just take two of these little cups, elevate this up again because I don't want to work bent over, but even more importantly, I want to be able to catch this edge very simply. These type of pads that are made by different companies, they, have, um, they simulate steel wool. This particular one is almost like 4 aught steel wool. Perfect for doing a detail like this. These are very soft so it conforms to the surface with the pressure of your fingers. Now we still have this inside edge to deal with. So these pads like this are absolutely perfect for something like this. There again, you have a little too much, a little excess there. Just take your putty knife with a clean cloth. You can get it right into those corners and clean that right up. I just dusted off our door. We're ready to spray apply our clear lacquer, again, our pre-cat gloss lacquer. And I want to reiterate a point. When I first put on the finish, before I put the paste filler, I only want to use one coat. And the reason being is I don't want to fill that open grain up with finish. I want to fill that open grain up with our color that we applied. If I put too much finish on it, when you go to try to take the excess off, it could pull right out of that open grain. Edges first. See how convenient these Lazy Susans are? I love these. Now we're going to turn the gun this way. This is called a cross hatch pattern. I spray applied a second coat of lacquer and now you can see what our piece looks like, our door sample looks like in its finished state. You may say to yourself, well why would I want to do something like this? It obviously seems like a lot of labor, but for me as a professional wood finisher, I'm often asked to do things that are outside of the box, if you will. And I think this is a very good example of something that you've probably not seen much of before. Let's say you had a client that came to you and said, I want you to make a dining table out of a slab of walnut. And the base to it, the truss to it, is going to be made out of chrome, some type of metal. I want this top to be very dramatic and a sharp contrast to the base. I think you could agree that this might be a good way to go about that. I hope you enjoyed.